Hello. This is Deb. Uh, sorry, let's stop. Anderson, the black woman animator. Black woman animator. Uh, let's, let's see. Come back to you. Another another video. In this video, I have oh to this side. <laughs> Karen. Powell um, from Signing Animation. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thank you for coming. That is all I will be doing in sign language. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to show my RIT peeps that I uh, respect, respect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, welcome, Karen. Uh, do a little, do a little introduction of yourself. Thank you for having me. First of all, I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Karen, uh, as as she spelled so beautifully, and uh, <laughs> I'm the director and co-founder of Signing Animation Studio based out of California, but uh, reaching across the world at this point. <laughs> uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, deaf representation in animation. Cool. So my first question I would like to start off with is what was your experience with art and animation growing up? That's, uh, there's a lot of fun family stories in there, but I'll see how, uh, how uh, I, I can get the abridged version in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I remember, that uh, when I was growing up, there was a, a big emphasis in my household on theater magic. Um, my mom and my dad are, are both directors, uh, theater and music respectively. And um, we would watch Star Trek together as a family. And whenever we would get nervous, like the kiddos, they would uh, tell us how those effects were done. Like that, that strange alien uh, parasite is just someone with like a, it's a model with some pantyhose over the hole and someone sticking their finger through and wiggling it. And it looks super freaky, but that actor's gonna get his paycheck and go home. Like that's That was the start of how did they do that and my fascination with that. And I saw um, The Little Mermaid. That was actually one of the first uh, fil films that I could uh, hear properly <laughs> or as much as I'm gonna. Uh, this one is decorative and uh, and this one is um, is doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I, got, um, I got this one I think uh, relatively later on. So I saw Little Mermaid and it was just this feast for the senses. And I desperately wanted both to know how they did the animation and to be a mermaid. So <laughs> <laughs> I worked my way up to one of them at least. Like I know there right. are some dedicated mermaids out there but I can't hold my breath that long. I just <laughs> can't do it. Yeah, understandable. Um, I, I actually, uh, I was in, uh, this is a second career for me. I was a flute player for, I think, around 15 years before I did this. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, and I switched over in large part due to watching Monsters University. <laughs> I just thought that the message in there, like, at, when I saw it, I was 30 years old, and I'm 36 now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I had just read an article about how, um, how unlikely it was that I was going to get the job I trained for. <laughs> I was feeling a bit salty. So uh, we went to the movie and part of what I got out of it was you can be really, really good at something and, and not succeed. It's about finding what you loved about it and going and getting it somewhere else. So yeah. um, I, I sort of absorbed that message, saw all those animators in the credits and I was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to go do that. <laughs> I'm defecting. <laughs> Cool. So, um, I guess con considering you, you, your hearing, did you ever think you couldn't have a 
Well, I guess you got to it later, but did you ever think you couldn't have an anime, uh, a career in animation? No, it's, um, it's, it never really occurred to me that it would be a barrier, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. My situation is very much a glass half full one. And the way that I hear allows me to pass uh, in most situations for, you know, a hearing person. So I right. didn't encounter a lot of the barriers that um, had happened for other people who, you know, can't hide theirs. <laughs> um, yeah. That, like, yeah, this is all the type of hearing I'd ever known. I got, I managed to squeeze 15 years of flute playing out of it. And <laughs> it works this yes. time. You know? So, um, what has been your animation journey until now, as far as your career? Oh yeah, so um, you heard the first part of the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. I convinced my partner to move out to California with me, and I got uh, private lessons from a Disney uh, Imagineer named Eric Serda in Maya, the software, the three D animation software. Um, mm -hmm. He basically donated the lessons, but. Um, I would give him a dozen cookies every time I saw him as a thank you. So I joke that I got the lessons for cookies. Um, nice. Then I started taking lessons at community college because I'd gotten my degree in music um, and I wasn't about to go through that again, <laughs> like the, the whole higher education system. So I took community mm -hmm. college courses with Paul Nas, who uh, also worked for Disney for a while. He's done a, a multitude of projects, but he's also the author of um, How to Cheat in Maya. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, and he just uh, really set me up for success. I started working at the Animation Collaborative as a TA after that, and that's where I heard about my first studio job uh, at Animon in San Francisco. And I worked my way up there from layout artist to animator to lead animator to fixed team lead. So um, I, I got a taste for <laughs> for leadership. <laughs> it's nice. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so to uh, let's talk more about you know the deaf community. What are more? What are the multiple ways people identify themselves in the deaf community? So I've um, I've noticed among the crew that there's a lot of openness about the type of hearing that they have. So they'll uh, introduce themselves with you know I'm I'm Austin. I'm profoundly deaf. Uh, there's profound deafness, single-sided deafness, hard of hearing. There's there's a lot of different uh, ways to classify oneself, and I'm sure there are many that I don't know yet, but um, mm -hmm. it does tend to fly in the face of the stereotype that it's something to be hidden or not discussed, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's marvelous. Um, can you explain what deaf gain is? Ooh, I love this one. <laughs> So deaf gain is in direct opposition to the idea of hearing loss. When, um, when people become deaf, they gain a community, a language, a culture, a, you know, a, this, just these riches uh, throughout their entire life that, you know, it, it, it is so much more powerful than the idea of, oh, here's what I've lost. Think about what you're getting mm -hmm. instead and, and what people who grow up this way have in uh, as far as advantages. Like, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> my, my crew uh, who use sign are some of the finest lie detectors I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't hurt that I, you know, I wear my emotions on my face all the time. So uh, mm -hmm. that's just one of um, a million different ways that, that people gain by being deaf. Mm hmm. I know um, I watched a video about it and the lady was saying, um, you know, some people, particularly at the beginning of COVID, they would um, visit their family and and they're like, talk, can't talk through a window, but deaf people can. <laughs> or um, or like, you know, when deaf people are talking, they're already socially distanced. <laughs> Yes, um, I actually used to use sign to flirt with my husband in public. <laughs> um, not not ever anything super explicit in case uh, someone was understanding me, but you know it was it was a good way to talk across distances. And you know it's um, it's good that he's learning more now. It used to be that if he I only taught him enough so that he could compliment me. <laughs> <And> it, <laughs> 
-hmm. wanted to chew me out, he had to sign it, like fingerspell it. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. now that he knows uh, more of the signs, he can let me know if he's not feeling happy with me uh, in a faster way. But uh, that's that's egalitarian. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you start signing animation and um, what are you trying to accomplish? Okay, so there's a there's a lot there. Let me see if I can get it concise. So um, you, I can you can uh, say it all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so um, the story of how it started is that um, is just with one person. Um, her name is Vivian. She is uh, profoundly deaf. She went to Gallaudet and she loves to dance. I made her up. And <laughs> she was the, uh, the protagonist in a short that I was writing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I knew that even though, you know, part of my uh, childhood was spent close with the deaf community in a mainstream elementary school, um, mm -hmm. even though I had, I guess, a slightly better understanding of deaf culture than your average uh, city, I knew that as I was someone outside of it, I needed artists who were inside to help me do it right. So mm -hmm. uh, I was very keen to find actual, you know, artists who spoke this language, who lived this experience to help me make sure that it was respectful and accurate. Yeah, I was, uh, I pitched at my former studio and uh, they decided to go a different direction. But fortunately in the room was uh, the person who's my producer now, Noreen Quinn. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. She was, she's always been very committed to diversity in storytelling. And thank goodness she understands, uh, as as you do, that um, diversity. You, it's on. You're on this side. <laughs> um, <laughs> that diversity includes the disability community and the deaf community as well. So she was mm -hmm. uh, very interested in making sure this happened right. We went looking for that deaf talent that I knew I needed, and uh, mm -hmm. it was such a struggle. Like I, I was looking in uh, most of the conventional places and. There were occasionally I would find these these gems and hoard them, but um, I noticed that they, I, I was I was actually really confused <laughs> because mm -hmm. as deaf and signing people have this amazing like sign users have this amazing spatial acuity and understanding of facial acting and mm -hmm. like and and fine you know body mechanics. I guess I just part of me assumed that they'd be everywhere in animation. So yeah. the fact that they were almost nowhere was was kind of shocking to me. So uh, we looked and looked, and then eventually I got to talk with Del Wetter, who runs the um, Exodus Film Group out of Los Angeles. He is a deaf film executive. And he told us that what will happen is that people will invest in a degree in 3D um, graphics and, and animation and modeling. They'll leave school, they'll show up to the interview, They'll get asked, how are we supposed to communicate with you? That'll be the end of it. And they'll have to go do something else eventually. <laughs> and yeah. that to me represented a, an unconscionable mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like one can love one's own career in art form and industry while being able to acknowledge the problems within it. Um, and this yeah. was one that I felt was not receiving um, attention or, or mm -hmm. view, um application. So I sat down with Nora and was like, okay, this is a bit bigger than we thought it was going to be. It's a little bigger than a short. <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, let's make this a nonprofit. We registered mm. through the state of California. We brought on people who understood the structure of this sort of thing better than we did. Cause you know, Nora, while being a, a highly educated and accomplished filmmaker um, is a bit new to the animation side and the nonprofit side. And while mm -hmm. I am an animation leader and, um, and a storyteller, I definitely need to know about like the payroll and tax side of things. So right. the business we, practices. Things out. we established our 50% uh, or greater deaf hard of hearing crew uh, standard. And mm -hmm. we were very firm from the beginning that that had to be at every level of what we were doing, that we weren't just gonna bring on 15 interns who, who use ASL and call it a day. Um, mm -hmm. We have deaf team members and ASL users who are on the production team, viz dev team, um, pretty much all the way through. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And that's what we 
really, really important to us to make sure that we're not just engaging in tokenism. Um, yeah. The, uh, the essential mission of the studio is on three different axes. Uh, we've got um, better representation in the field behind the camera, so um, more mm -hmm. jobs. <laughs> um, better storytelling uh, with deaf culture. Uh, I have mm -hmm. a whole other thing about what we've got right now <laughs> as opposed to what we need. <laughs> yeah. Um, better studios for people to go into once they've got the training and the experience through us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the, the rough outline of it. <laughs> cool. Uh, what long-term long goals for your organization and how will you know you've made your um, intended impact? So um, from the start, uh, one of our major um our major goals was a 200% increase in deaf, hard of hearing employment in American based animation studios. Uh, and we thought that was a pretty sky high goal. And the more I spoke with colleagues and friends at Pixar and, you know, the, the bigger, the heavier hitters, um, mm -hmm. whenever I asked them the question, have you ever had a deaf or hard of hearing colleague that you know of? The answer was always no. Now I know that there are some, through these studios, but the fact that it's that rare, <laughs> yeah, um, that we're going to be adding like a zero to the end of the two hundred percent, like yeah. and it's still very achievable. Um, we really want to set the bar for um, deaf representation in animated stories. So okay. what we have right now has it's it's better than what we have had before, um, but still has a ways to go. So mm -hmm. we're going to shoot really high and try and make sure that other other stories meet that standard. Um, yeah. And finally, we'll know that we've succeeded uh, when we are able to sit down with these larger studios and help them to prepare for the deaf talent coming in. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, we had a large studio who was interested in uh, one of our artists recently. And of course I, I forwarded her to the interested party, but I was very, firm about the fact that like, you guys have got to be ready for her. Yeah. <laughs> um, this has got this uh, situation as far as interviews go that um, people have been putting up with till this point is not acceptable. So mm -hmm. being clear about standards there and what they should be. Yeah. Um, what, what is the internal culture like at Signing Animation and what do you do to build a sense of team unity, especially when everything is remote? That is an ongoing process. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of us are struggling to maintain, you know, friendships <laughs> remotely. Uh, but everything that we're doing is, oh, let's see. So we, um, we have a high emphasis within the team on um, mental health and uh, open communication. So from the start, uh, we want to make sure that when people have a tough mental health day or when they need something extra during a meeting or you know anything along those lines that they talk about it and that it's not a thing mm -hmm. like it's not a big deal um right and then as far as our uh that's that's as far as culture goes like we are essentially paving the road for interested studios uh in the future for uh, integrated teams because while we've you know we've met and exceeded our 50 percent deaf or great deaf hard of hearing or greater goal um we uh, we still have hearing people on the crew and that's going to be the circumstance in a lot of different studios so um there's a lot of learning that we're doing <laughs> uh by no means have we perfected anything yet but uh we are very clear about the fact that we know we have a, you know learning to do that um, adjustments or uh, changes can be suggested and they will be taken seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And in our actual handbook, our guidelines like, you know, it, it, while it's possible to learn much about another culture, uh, just because you know a lot doesn't mean that you are in it. <laughs> so um, yeah. matter like when someone brings up something about their culture, uh, that's not a matter of, of argument or debate. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So setting those uh, expectations ahead of time as people come in, we found has been a, a crucial part. Um, as far as our, as what we do for fun, um, we've had a lot of fun with Netflix party, <laughs> the extension on Chrome. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> a Friday night Star Trek rewatch. We started right at the beginning of Next Generation and we're moving our way forward. Um, and it's basically us mystery science theater 3000-ing our way through the worst episodes and like chatting about our deepest, darkest fears and the better ones. Cause you know how next generation is like heavy on the philosophy. Um, yeah. sparks great discussions. Uh, and then we also unite over activism and outreach. Like, uh, mm -hmm. we've been able to contribute meaningfully to several causes, uh, over the last several months. And I think that uniting behind, um, uh, ways to help is a really important way to uh, to feel like a team when you're doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, you know, we do silly stuff on the Slack, like we share pictures of our pets and pretend they're our PAs because we don't have any yet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, what are some obstacles that deaf and hard of hearing artists go through when trying to break into the animation industry? Well, among many, <laughs> uh, uh, these have been outlined to me as people have come in. Uh, I've heard, for instance, that people, um, that, that story that I was telling you earlier about how people will be granted the interview, and then instead of being asked to do a test or to demonstrate skill, the only question is, uh, and it's a rhetorical one, is how do we communicate? Um, that's not something that uh, most applicants get asked, and that varies right. a fault. <laughs> um, not being ready for this deaf talent coming in, not including disability in sensitivity training. Um, that's, uh, that's a lot, some of the obstacles. Then another one is that for a lot of users of ASL, particularly from, um, from childhood, English mm -hmm. is their second language. Um, so there will be judgments about their their grasp of English based off of, you know, resumes, cover letters, et cetera, without the mm -hmm. understanding that it's a second language and is in fact no reflection whatsoever on their skill or intelligence. Um, I yeah. think that that gets skipped over a lot in anti-bias training, <laughs> especially when algorithms are doing so much of the work these days. Yeah. And there's plenty oh, more, but those are the ones I have off the top of my head. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I'm a testament that um, you can do a lot in the art industry with not being able to communicate. Because when I worked in Korea, I was not fluent in Korean and my department, my department was not fluent in English. But we made it work for a year while I was there. So, right. I mean, make it bigger, make it smaller. And then you can learn some sign language colors or some, some keywords. I mean, you can make it work. <laughs> yeah, yes, you can make it work. That's the attitude that I'm really hoping to impart to the people that we're talking with right now in, in larger studios. In fact, um, along the, eh, you're over here, along those <laughs> lines, our, uh, our rigger, Austin Belleg, he uh, ended up going to Malaysia for a few years to get paying work. Um, made it work over there. <laughs> I think that... Yeah. I, that's it's proof. It's proof that a lot of the the so-called barriers standing in the way are um, avoidable and workable around. Like it's it's um, it's of a con it's a constructed nature, not a real one. On um, you know on that side, not mm -hmm. you know, it's very real for for deaf applicants, but the people who are putting up the barriers are doing it on a completely imaginary basis. <laughs> yeah, because even for me, I was willing to learn the languages. It just was hard. <laughs> so. That's why. I, kept but, but. I remember when I first met you, we were talking about um, about how we have the language slots in our brains. Yeah, <laughs> like let me speak Spanish now because <laughs> that's the language I know. That doesn't yep. work. <laughs> I got Spanish sign in English and and sign barely. So like whenever um, some when I'm in another country and someone tries to speak to me and say German, I'll just automatically respond in Spanish. Oh, I feel so bad for them. <laughs> yeah, but as long as we're all trying, we're, we're good. Yeah. What are some uh, taboo things that deaf people go through in the workplace that people don't realize is inappropriate? So there are, again, there are plenty, uh, but a couple that I know of, at least from stories from my crew, are um, just overall the assumption that deafness is something to be cured, corrected, or pitied. Mm -hmm. um, that it is not, that's an affliction rather than a culture. So mm -hmm. um, 
that is deeply insulting <laughs> and uh, and pretty backwards if you think about it. Like there's been right. plenty of discussion about it for quite a while. So I think the patience with that viewpoint is wearing thin. Um, there's also vast amounts of exclusion from networking opportunities. We all know that um, that the big stuff gets done not you know at the studio or in the office, but in coffee shops and bars and you know events like that. So uh, not being invited out to social stuff, not being included, that's uh, that's endemic. That happens everywhere, and um, and it's a big shocker when you know so th then there's fallout from that. Like, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and like you mentioned earlier, uh, I, I think you know people questioning agents, agents where you know when when maybe fully or, or partially deaf people use their voice and it's not clear, that might indicate like I could see a, a misconception about just because they they uh, you know people don't realize that deaf people can't hear themselves, so that's the, why they're not speaking clearly, not because they're dumb or anything like that. Yeah, so, yeah. The, the deaf accent is actually, um, it's, it's lovely. It's, um, it's, it's an accent, like an accent for any other language. And the mm -hmm. fact that people fall all over themselves for the French one and not for the deaf one is a mystery to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what, let's see. Generally, as human beings, how can we include deaf people in the idea of diversity? Not even just, just not even just in the animation industry, just as human beings. I mean, approaching it with the understanding as uh, that it's a culture, it's a language minority. It has a history. It has um, social mores and uh, and folklore. Uh, it's it's something that is uh, that's a delight, honestly, to learn about as an outsider. Like you know, I and. Um, and it's something that people love to discuss if you just give them the chance. Like it's, there's there's this weird sort of anxiety that I've noticed around people who hear differently. Like, am I going to say or do something that offends this person? Um, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. that kind of fear can only stand in the way of meaningful relationships or attempt, right. you know, proper communication. So um, just, being brave, understanding as you would with any other culture that you're going to look a little bit silly when you start dipping your toes in, <laughs> that you're not mm -hmm. going to understand everything right away. And, um, and understanding, you know, an understanding of deaf history will go a long way to uh, an understanding about it as a modern culture. What are some ways that companies can support deaf uh, animation professionals? Ooh, so uh, I'm seeing an awful lot of uh, excuses being removed now that we're in a digital workplace. <laughs> um, all that nonsense about uh, about accessibility being, you know, you can't work from home stuff is suddenly no longer a problem. <laughs> yeah. Embracing the new digital workplace can go a really long way, especially in deaf and hard of hearing accessibility. Like, uh, personally, I've found a lot of currency in being able to rely on auto closed captions. Um, mm -hmm. It really helps when I've missed a word to not have to say again all the time. Um, and places like Meets and um, I think Skype uh, have fairly decent ones. Uh, the, the errors that they make make for good comedy. Um, <laughs> it also helps to have an interpreter uh, and it, or an interpretation team as a matter of course in your company. Like there's mm -hmm. this uh, there's this fallacy that you've got to uh, whenever you hire a deaf individual, you've got to hire an interpreter for them. And the thing is, if you have a, a team like of say three or four interpreters, um, they can help out with a larger one. They can interpret it meetings, they can interpret it group things. Like it's not as though it's a one to one type of ratio. An investment in an yeah. interpreter means that you can bring on twice as much, if not four times as much deaf talent. So um, mm -hmm. that's another example of what you gain. <laughs> so yeah, um, embracing digital workplace, having an interpretation team, definitely. 
what are the advantages to employing deaf artists in animation particular? Oh gosh, so many. <laughs> I, I've mentioned how the language itself uh, lends itself to good animation. Like we, mm -hmm. uh, we rely on, um, a, 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 in 3D particularly, we rely on the principle of constant motion for the illusion of life. Nobody's gonna understand that better <laughs> than a sign user. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's like, like I, like I mentioned earlier, the ability to, um, to show when somebody is trying to hide something on their face. Like that mm -hmm. type of stuff figures into the most difficult animation principle of all, which is appeal. And I mean, this, this is a set of people who have grown up with the tools to impart appeal. <laughs> Why would you not, mm -hmm. you know, break down their door <laughs> to, uh, to hire them as animators? I mean, that's what I'm doing. And I feel like I'm sitting on a pile of gold um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm chucking it at everybody who will, who will take it as well. I'm not keeping it all to myself, but um, the, the language itself imparts an incredible uh, understanding of, of bodies, of emotions, of faces, of spatial awareness. And it's just the gift that keeps on giving, honestly. Um, and even mm -hmm. myself, like as someone who has difficulty hearing, I am a spectacular lip reader. <laughs> So that means that I, I, you know, I never really had to struggle with the lip reading side of things. Um, and that may sound like a brag, but <laughs> as someone who was a talented musician and then moved into a, the, into a, a field where I had to, um, where I had to work for it <laughs> and who knows the difference, mm -hmm. like I had that little foothold of here's the one thing that I don't have to try too hard in order to succeed at. And that was lip sync. <laughs> And it's, it's because I can't hear them very well, <laughs> not, you know, in spite of, it's a, it's an advantage that I have. Nice. So, I mean, I feel like you, you I don't even have to answer this, ask this question because you've answered it multiple times over, but just as a statement um, with animation being a visual medium and with ASL and deaf culture being so visual, that relates to the, relates to the power that deaf artists have deaf artists have as visual storytellers because there's the facial expressions body movement like uh, it just all the emotion on the face and man tap into this tap into this people right, that's <laughs> what i'm saying like that and so i've got to brag on our story artist here for a little bit um she she walked in the door and blew everybody away with the creativity and understanding of framing and just and she's uh she's a professional she's uh she's graduated she's done work out in the field just she's relatively young as far as these things are counted or at least she seems that way to me an ancient woman of 36 uh but mm -hmm. she she just has this creativity when it comes to how to frame these shots that mm -hmm. um has has kept us laughing kept us engaged um and we she just she hasn't had to you know improve on that at all at all <laughs> she just teaches us what to do mm -hmm. uh, and where where we collaborate is in how to you know make the story strongest suggesting where to use a dutch angle now and again like the discussions are fireworks and i just i love my visual development team so much i love the whole crew it's just that the the viz dev um meetings are, are absolute catnip to me. <laughs> I could only imagine how maybe naturally good deaf people might be at even, you know, as you mentioned, like composition, because even though ASL is like explosive, you still have to keep stuff in this wall because if you're spelling over, spelling over here, or you have to keep stuff in this frame so that people can see it and, and grasp it. And so I'm wondering how that would translate to composition. And like, because there's, you know, in Maya, the frame, the frame that you have to keep all the action in. Yeah. Duh, yeah. duh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd, you'd think that it would present um, strictures in, in how, to, uh, how to have dialogue and stories uh, when your characters are signing. But honestly, I've seen more clever, artistic, and illustrative framing and, uh, and choices through this production that we're doing now than I have before mm -hmm. ever, um, just because 
I, I honest to God in art in general believe that when you put, you know, strictures in place, like we must be able to see this person from the waist up, for instance, um, mm -hmm. you get vastly more creative. It's, it's like, um, it's like haikus. Uh, if you have the strict, you know, five, seven, five, you got to get your message across in there. It's one of the most treasured forms of art because of that, you know, and yeah. that, that applies everywhere, absolutely everywhere, mm -hmm. including animation. Uh, how can we make networking and other events more inclusive for the deaf community? So uh, besides having an interpreter present and, and you know, actually inviting people, <laughs> um, it's good to, to familiarize yourself with some basic sign to, um, as I said earlier, to embrace that you're not gonna seem particularly smart in sign uh, when you're starting out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that uh, you just get comfortable with, with typing, um, with asking the person that you're, most importantly of all, asking the person that you're with what their preferred communication method is uh, if you're not signing. Um, mm -hmm sure that when, uh, if you're dealing with somebody who's more comfortable with lip reading, that you uh, don't stand somewhere where you're backlit, make sure you can be seen, that you're in a well-lighted area. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, learning, learning a couple basic signs never hurts, ever. Um, it's, a, it's a welcoming gesture and it's a way to connect a little bit more with a really gorgeous culture. What are some things that uh, to keep in mind in regard to the deaf community when it comes to content creation? So like animation YouTubers, podcasters, social media and more. How can we be more inclusive in those uh, platforms? Seek it out and promote it. <laughs> promote the ever loving crap out of it. <laughs> like, it's out mm -hmm. there. Like, there's um, if you just search for, you know, deaf artist, deaf art on Instagram. Um, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose of amazingness. <laughs> and the more mm -hmm. that these artists uh, are, are shared and shown around, the, the better the circulation about, you know, these, these social mores and these, uh, these causes, these, um, these desires from the community. Like it eliminates mm -hmm. the unknowns, the more that you share and seek out art from any culture, I believe, honestly, like it's a fantastic lens through which to learn more about, you know, someone else's experience, whether it's an individual or a group. So like, look, look them up on YouTube, look them up on Instagram, find, um, like, I, I wish there were some artists that I had right off the top of my head to promote, um, but they're, they're out there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that's it's not all that hard to find them. <laughs> so, so in the in the hearing community, uh, like people like me who have YouTube channels and people like who have podcasts, and you know, how can we be more ac accessible? Ah, closed caption. <laughs> Please enable the captions. Um, whether or not you think that they're sufficient or accurate, like. Uh, having them at all is going to be really, really important. Um, that's, I mean, it's important for me. <laughs> I, I'm speaking partially selfishly here because it's a huge bummer when someone is speaking a million miles an hour or my laptop is quiet and I can't quite pick up what they're saying. I just tune right out. So it's, it's a good move to have closed captions on your videos, uh, regardless of whether or not you anticipate that a deaf audience will be there because it's handy for everybody. Like we are huge advocates of cro closed captioning across the board. Um, and if you're, if you're worried about whether or not it's uh, going to draw attention just to the bottom of the screen, as opposed to, um, you know, the, where you want it to be, I'm going to ask creators to understand that people are good at multitasking, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. visually. And, that if you're worried about it, there are ways to incorporate closed captions cr uh, creatively. Like some of the stuff that I've seen with floating or tracking captions is so gut bustingly funny. <laughs> like, I wish there was so much more of it. Like there's a uh, there's a series of like the internal monologues of Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice that has those like following them around the the screen. Love that. Mm -hmm up with a spoon more more of that please 
there is a large community of hearing people that use closed captioning and you know with um the tv show lovecraft country that is out mm. now yeah because it because it has so much going on i've seen people say that they put on captions so they don't even miss what they're saying because you know sometimes there'll be a word that's maybe foreign or they just don't know what the word is because they're mumbling or something like that and so there are so many hearing people that also use closed captions oh my gosh i i want to think about the like the sheer amount of time i would have saved if closed captions had been more popular just a couple of years ago with my gra my grandmother um who is a, a woman of remarkable intelligence and a kind heart cannot understand British accents. <laughs> <laughs> I would want to show her, you know, Downton Abbey or something. And um, it was, yeah. what's he saying? <laughs> over and over. So having closed captions is handy for everybody. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you propose to improve deaf uh, representation in animated stories? So there are um, there are a couple routes that we're taking all at once because um, it's you know if we're going to be setting the bar we've got to make sure that we're doing it absolutely right. So um, I'm gonna get I'm gonna nerd at you a little bit about animation techniques. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. You ready? <laughs> so um, in animation in 3D, there's uh, the way that they try to make it. Uh, appear more lifelike and more like there's an actual camera in there is motion blur, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that is very handy in a lot of circumstances, except when there are a lot of short, sharp movements that are happening very quickly in succession. That mm -hmm. all gets lost in there. Like my <laughs> this is this what's happening here on the screen right now is essentially what's going on in the 3D environment as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse bless them, uh, <laughs> normalized and, uh, and streamlined the whole concept of eliminating motion blur in favor of smear frames, like that 2D, 3D synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there was a clarity of motion. There was like, I, I saw people snapping back and forth between those poses so rapidly and yet intelligibly. I'm like, there, mm -hmm. that's the technique that I, <laughs> that I need in order to make sign language work. Because what you've got in, uh, when you have sign in uh, animation these days, which you get a lot of the time, and I'm not saying all the time, but a lot of the time, is super slow stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't work for, for kids, for people who are learning it for the first time. But if you're trying to reach the, um, the, the many numbered and very interested in media adult deaf audience, then you've got, mm -hmm. hi, how are you to make it, you know, uh, work with motion blur. And that just, it doesn't help anybody really. <laughs> so yeah. to that the language comes across, uh, you know, fluently to native speakers and that it's uh, accurately represented to people who, you know, haven't maybe haven't encountered it before, get rid of that motion blur. Um, we have our pipeline going right now in such a way that we are still working in 3d, but we, um, we texture everything flat and we just put everything in flat lighting as we, uh, when we render it out. And then we add in lighting and particle effects afterwards uh, composited. So that mm -hmm. means that we have simple shapes, good, strong outlines. We have a good focus on silhouette. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another, that's another way that it helps like to focus in on silhouette and uh, the pursuit of doing well by signing is to uh, is to cleave to animation principles. Like we, there, yeah. what silhouette silhouette is drilled into us when we're learning. And um, it's, hey, <laughs> that ties in so nicely, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, and, and none of this would mean anything if it weren't for the fact that we have deaf and uh, signing artists who are bringing these characters to life. Like another thing that I see, and again, not all the time, but enough of the time <laughs> is you'll have a character, and even I can see this, which is um, saying something, <laughs> who is, uh, who's signing in the scene, but is very evidently animated by a hearing artist because mm -hmm. for instance, um, it's a basic sign language thing that when you're asking questions, uh, you illustrate what type of question it is by where your eyebrows are. So if you're asking mm -hmm. who, eyebrows down, that's just yeah. Yeah. Thing. Unless it's rhetorical, in which case eyebrows up, 
that the eyebrows are engaged. Last right. time I saw someone signing an animation and I won't say on which show, there was nothing happening in the face, <laughs> just nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you see this, these initiatives out right now with COVID making sure that, you know, there are clear masks so people's mouths can be seen. That's like, I, you know, proportionately, I'd say 40% of the communication happens right up in here and in relation to mm -hmm. here. So if nothing's happening, that's not intelligible. It's not correct. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm channeling David from uh, Schitt's Creek right now. That is not correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, that uh, representation behind the behind the scenes is more than just the correct moral thing to do. It's the correct technique. <laughs> like yeah. uh, it's it's on both fronts, and not neither of them can work without the other. Honestly, mm -hmm. I can imagine uh, uh, the hearing community in the animation industry saying that, well. Uh, and scans moving and talking is too hard. So what can you say to that? <laughs> Take a challenge. <laughs> like, what, why stop with the hands are hard? Um, that's, I, we, we see way too much mediocre art that's the result of people hedging their bets. So mm -hmm. challenge, man. <laughs> uh, also, <clears throat> I was watching a clip with the very famous deaf actress that's blonde and her name starts with an M, I think. Marley Matlin. Yes. <laughs> and, Hi, Marley. Um, it, was, it was in a show she was in mm -hmm. and I, it was another video I was watching on Deaf Game. <laughs> and so um, the people in the comments were saying, oh, you could tell this was edited by a hearing person because, you know, here in the hearing community, we cut to see people's reactions, but you, they were cutting in between her signing. So it's like, so oh, there's yeah. like a balance of, of there, you're there, you're, you, if you're, if you have signing content, you have to be able to see the sign language. But then in the hearing community, we don't even think, because as you know, there's, there are shots where the person is talking off screen and you're not even on there. So it, you see them, you see them, or just like these type of, all these type of shots where it doesn't matter that you see the, the action and so right. that's the disconnect with the hearing editor where he didn't take note that okay this is a a, a a scene where she's signing and if if it's about being deaf then you need to be able to see what she's saying but also they would they want to show the reaction of the students too so it's like oh what do you do do you have like split screen or something <laughs> 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 I mean, there, that's that's the other part of it of of take the challenge, and I think <laughs> what's missing in the equation there is an understanding that oh, deaf and people and sign users are watching your show. <laughs> like, make this a meaningful thing as opposed to a, a novelty or something that you're putting up there just to check a box. Like, yeah. Yeah. you can tell that that happens when like. Oh, there's a there's a clip that I love from West Wing in particular where she bursts into the room um, with a with a sharp critique for for somebody, and mm -hmm. she's signing so gorgeously and but and and the, but the framing, it's just like it's from it's here so you can see her fingers flashing down below. I'm like, what? Oh, no, yeah. where? <laughs> What's she saying? <laughs> So like framing is another is another big aspect of it. Um, recognizing that you can't, uh, well, shouldn't uh, cut back and forth, uh, you know, before someone's done mm -hmm. speaking, um, that sort of thing. And the cardinal sin, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> is focusing in on the interpreter and not the person who is signing. I learned that at RIT. Mm, uh, and it's Not it's another thing which is uh, it's part of the it ties into the networking stuff and accessibility stuff. And for the love of God, watch the person who's actually communicating, not the the interpreter. Like they're the interpreter is communicating, but they're communicating on behalf of somebody. So look at mm -hmm. the person whose ideas it is. <laughs> even with that, even with the, uh, practicing doing my intro, I'm like. Man, this is a, such a small space. How do I make sure everybody can see my hands? <laughs> there's, um, I mean, there's a fair amount of currency to be gotten from a fisheye lens. I'll say that much. <laughs> a 
wide angles also help. <laughs> what are the immediate next steps for the studio? What will you be working on in the next few months? Okay, so we've got um, truly an unexpected level of interest in what we're doing. Um, I'm going to say this as a credit to the animation world. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> We are, we are relatively young as studios are counted and we weren't expecting to receive much interest until year three, year four. Um, but companies mm -hmm. are displaying an intense level of engagement about um, getting ready for deaf talent, uh, having proper deaf representation. Uh, I am really, uh, we're, we're speaking with these people uh, and with upper management in these companies as part of our consulting wing. Um, we happen to have on our team uh, one of the, I believe, either the only or one of the only deaf HR um, Fortune 500 company executives. His name is um, Sam Sepa, and he is, uh, he's been doing accessibility work with companies like Google, and now mm -hmm. he's doing it with us, <laughs> and we are so lucky. <laughs> but he, um, well, this is a service we offer. We're doing that now so that people are ready for our talent when they come through their door. And then... Mm -hmm. Uh, as far as our actual projects go, we have um, we have several different ones in the works, which seems ambitious for a young studio, but uh, we've been approached by two different film studios for um, essentially for doing outside work with them um, and mm -hmm. providing funding. So we're doing an animated logo for somebody, which is wrapping, I think, in the next two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. We are working on our own short, which uh, has been, I think, just entered visual development. And then uh, we, we, had, uh, we had a short initially that went all the way through visual development and up through layout. And then we had a discussion with a rather famous animation producer, a very famous animation producer who was like, this is a great film. Um, how many, what's your runtime? And we were like 15 minutes. And he goes, oh no, no, no. <laughs> this has gotta be a feature length film. And we're like, well, we gotta wait until we have the money to do that. <laughs> so yeah. a shorter short it is. So we, we pivoted to do that. Um, <laughs> and we're working on that right now. Uh, fortunately, we're using the same characters and setting that we had in the previous one. So we've got a leg up on this new um, part and we're stronger as a team. So I anticipate it's gonna mm -hmm. take much of this time. Uh, and then we, uh, we've been invited to do a short as part of an anthology that's being pitched to larger studios. And thank goodness, uh, this short is experimental. And I love experimental animation. Like I, I appreciate educational and children's programming so, so much, but mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. it puts by the wayside those of us who love animation and want to see our stories in that medium. Like, what, what's frustrated me a lot when I was circulating the script for the original short, um, which has been a finalist in a couple of competitions now, um, but mm -hmm. that uh, what I <laughs> when I was entering it in, they would say, what's the genre? And you'd see drama, romance, animation. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, no. <laughs> animation isn't a genre, it's a medium. So um, yeah. That and telling weird stories in animation is something that we have, you know, we've wanted to do since the start. So having the chance to do that is just amazing. And uh, that is also in development with a different team as we speak. So basically, as people come from us from outside and get us the funding, we'll establish a branch dedicated to that project. Like there is... Mm -hmm. So much talent to choose from. We've we've finally found it. Like a lot of the avenues that we've gone through are, you know, social media and um, searching using uh, famous deaf universities like Ali Uh We mm -hmm. finally have a method for uh, tracking down and recruiting deaf talent. So we, uh, if you give us nice. the money, we the people. <laughs> cool. Um, when you were talking about you know selecting the genre, it made me think about how. Even in, there's been several, because, you know, as a, I go by Black Woman Animator, but I'm actually a 3D modeler. And mm -hmm. so I remember there was one situation where, you know, in this, this, the past several months of this, like, rejuvenation of, like, getting diversity, particularly, like, with Black people, there's been some lists that's been created. And there, uh, this was, like, some live action people, but they were kind of including animation list list. And I told, I remember I, re I reached out to the uh, woman and I was like, okay, my thing is not, is not 
included in this and I can't click it and I don't because I think it was only animator but I didn't want to pick animator because I didn't want a person looking at the list to think I was an animator and get the wrong idea because people on the outside looking in think everybody is animators <laughs> and she was like oh well just she didn't even she was just like well just click it and we'll deal with it later and it's just like okay you're in the black community and you're trying to increase diversity but you're not even listening to me <laughs> like I need this extra check mark on a Google form. <laughs> like, I, just had it. Man, I laugh so I don't cry. That's that's ridiculous. Right. And, and then there's like other lists where um, they just, yeah, they either leave off animation entirely, you know, in the black community or, they, or even in the animation industry, they will have literally every role except a 3D modeler. I'm like, why don't y'all like that? <laughs> like, wow. like, man that's another mess <laughs> so it's just like i i've gotta, I gotta advocate for like the production people outside of animators <laughs> like like yeah. texture artists lighters like come on think about us so yeah. oh my gosh like i the the animators are held up as sort of like the life bringers but what on earth would we be without the modelers the riggers the lighters the everything like mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a ted talk on lighting um that came out as a result i believe of brave uh it, it, so it'll be a little bit dated but the role that lighting itself plays in uh dictating the mood of a scene that i was just stapled to for like a couple weeks <laughs> like yeah. i might be an animator but i definitely understand and respect the contributions of other teams. Like, especially after having seen the pipeline at my former studio and like and dipping my toe into a bunch of other uh, teams. It's like, wow, yeah. we really need you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I like explaining to people about who are outsiders uh, of the animation industry about how it works. Like um, mm -hmm. I, for, for people like, like my esteemed grandmother, um, who, who don't quite understand it, I'll say, you know, it's basically like playing with digital dolls. Like you have the person who makes the model um, and that's a statue. And then you have another person mm -hmm. who tells it how to move and where and how much, and that's the rigor. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta give, you gotta give them skin. <laughs> so that's the, that's the, and hair, that's the texture artist. I've been, yeah. I've been having a fun yeah. debate recently with whether or not we were going to be doing um, FX hair or ice cream hair <laughs> for our characters. Yeah. So uh, to be continued on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun explaining it to people just so they understand yeah. specializations that are involved. Right. Uh, how, uh, hang, on working with, hang on working with larger companies to prepare them for deaf talent. So um, we are working with them on pretty much like the whole process from recruitment okay. into, uh, you know, dailies etiquette and things like that. Um, okay. It's, yeah, um, and you know, and HR stuff, like how do you make yourself inviting so that you can talk about subjects like, you know, accessibility and how you can improve as opposed to uh, shying away from the entire subject by excluding a whole group of people. Like that's, yeah. That's not particularly brave, uh, but fortunately, I have noticed, uh, like I said, a, a bunch of studios who are who are getting braver, and I'm very proud. <laughs> Great. Um, so, how can people follow the organization and get in touch with you? So we have um, a burgeoning uh, <laughs> it's uh, social media presence. Uh, we're we're mm -hmm. learning. Go, but uh, we have some very talented people working with us. We have an Instagram, um, signing underscore animation. We got a Facebook page. Uh, the website is signinganimation.com. Uh, and you can contact us directly through the website. Um, some of our more meaningful contacts have actually reached it out through that, you know, contact us smiley face part of the website. <laughs> so, and mm -hmm. we respond. Like, that's, uh, that's something that we take very seriously. So, um, Reaching out to write uh, is, and, and a range of video conference is always extremely welcome. We're just happy to talk with freaking anybody. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, Karen, for coming on this platform and telling us about signing and, 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 you know, giving us the behind the scenes about the deaf community. Uh, it'll give people insight and allow them to think about being more inclusive and diversity not only with you know race gender sexual orientation but also accessibility and 
in, in including the deaf community. Thank you so much for having me on this. I respect what you do tremendously. And this was really exciting and fun. And you're an awesome interviewer. <laughs> Well, to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Seal the Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. <laughs>